Oh, good evening. Uh, Mark chapter 6 for tonight. Because of the uh, snow and ice storm, all of our schedule got pushed back a week. Uh, what a difference a week makes, right? Last week we were under uh, ice and snow, couldn't get out. Today it's 75 degrees. It's amazing. Uh, I want to mention when we sent out that email last week about canceling services, there was a link in there to the Freed Hardeman University Lectureship. I encourage you to watch some of those. If you haven't done that, you need to do that. Uh, it's on Ecclesiastes. The, the, the topic is encountering Ecclesiastes, finding meaning in a meaningless world. It's very uh, appropriate for today. Uh, but the 13 lessons on Ecclesiastes, uh, for sure, are really worth uh, watching. They're professionally done, uh, very well done. Um, I've watched four or five of those. If you have time for one, Watch Dan Winkler's on Ecclesiastes chapter 2. Has anyone seen that one? <laughs> you need to watch that. Uh, it's, it's just amazing. Um, a little trailer, not, not to spoil anybody's uh, anticipation of that, but uh, Brother Dan goes through the uh, uh, second chapter of Ecclesiastes where Solomon is looking for the meaning of life. And of course, uh, he doesn't find it in chapter 2. Uh, but Brother Winkler uses that to guide us to what our goal in life should be. It may not be what you think. Um, I was a bit uh, um, not surprised, but uh, delighted, I guess, in, in Dan's take on that. It was really good. Uh, he takes us to our goal in life, uh, what our guide should be. That shouldn't be a surprise. And some guideposts. Uh, but he does a really good job on what the meaning of life is. What is it we should be doing? It's really, really good. And he ends the lesson with two words that he says will absolutely pinpoint what's important in your life. He tells you two words. Those two words will tell you what's important in your life. You may or may not guess what those are. Anyway, it's very good. That's kind of to wet your whistle. List of those. Click, click the link. Uh, they'll be there for a while, but those are really, really good. So I encourage you to, to look for those. So Mark chapter 6 uh, for tonight. And the last one I did was in Mark chapter 3, and a lot of things uh, sort of go hand in hand as far as what Jesus is dealing with. And uh, so I'm glad to be able to do these uh, sort of in, in tandem. Let's start with uh, reading the first uh, six verses of uh, Mark chapter 6. Uh, speaking of Jesus, he went away from there and came to his hometown, and his disciples followed him. And on the Sabbath, he began to teach in the synagogue, and many who heard him were astonished, saying, Where did this man get these things? What is the wisdom given to him? How are such mighty works done by his hands? Is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary, and the brother of James and Joseph and Judas and Simon, and are not his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. And Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honor except in his hometown, and among his relatives and his own household. And he could do no mighty work there, except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and healed them. And he marveled because of their unbelief, and he went about among the villages teaching. Here we see Jesus has uh, no respect in his hometown. His hometown is Nazareth. We learn in, in uh, Luke that uh, Joseph and Mary lived in Nazareth um, prior to uh, Jesus' birth, and they returned there uh, after having been had to leave uh, because of the first Jews were here. They left for a time, come back to Nazareth. So uh, Nazareth is where Jesus grew up, and so he calls that uh, his hometown. Now, Nazareth is an unremarkable place. Its only notoriety is the fact that Jesus uh, lived there. There's nothing else notable about, about Nazareth, small town, nothing going on there, pretty... Uh, uh, not even as below average, I guess we'd say. But after John's arrest, we'll go, John the Baptist, we'll get to John the Baptist here again in a few minutes. But after John the Baptist's arrest, Jesus begins his ministry, but he moves to Capernaum. And so Capernaum is where Jesus lived uh, or spent most of his time uh, during his ministry. But he goes back on this occasion back to Nazareth uh, to, uh, to teach there. One interesting thing, I, I find some things in the Bible that you're, you're reading, you thought, I never thought that before. 
And uh, I found something that I thought was kind of remarkable in Matthew, speaking about John the Baptist. Over Matthew chapter 3, uh, chapter 3, first two verses. In those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea, quote, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand, unquote. We all know that, right? That's John's message. Go over to Matthew chapter 4 and verse 17. From that time, Jesus began to preach, saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. I never thought that before. Jesus picks up exactly where John left off. John's mission was to preach the kingdom of heaven is at hand. John gets arrested. His ministry is over. Jesus takes over. What's his message? Same thing John was saying. He's going to take it further. But I never thought that before, that Jesus starts out preaching exactly the same thing that John the Baptist did, because John the Baptist was preparing for Jesus to come. I thought that was fascinating uh, when I made that connection there. Anyway, he goes to the synagogue, which was his uh, practice. We read in other places that Jesus uh, was his custom uh, to go to the synagogues on the Sabbath uh, and there to read. We find him in Luke uh, chapter 4, uh, reading from the book of Isaiah. So he goes there to, uh, to read from the, the, the law, the uh, scriptures, uh, to teach and also to do some healing. Uh, and so uh, synagogues have been built all around the areas where there was a uh, uh, much of a Jewish population, that was their gathering place uh, to come together uh, on the Sabbath. So, Jesus is teaching there, and get back to place in Mark. It says the people were astonished. This word astonished comes from a Latin word that means struck by lightning. That's what the word astonished means. When I read that, I thought, when I was a boy, I was in my, on my, my uh, grandfather's porch. It was during a storm. I don't know if we were waiting for the storm to pass so we could go home or what. We lived in a different town. We're sitting on the porch in, during a thunderstorm. All of a sudden, a bolt of lightning hits an electric pole out in the yard. I was astonished. came out of nowhere. It's unbelievable. It's just astonishing. That's what that means, struck by lightning. And so these people see and hear Jesus, see what he's doing, hear he's teaching. They're like struck by lightning. They're, you can't believe this. What, what is this? Out of nowhere, where, where's this come from? Uh, and so they ask some questions here. And these are rhetorical questions because in the question, they're actually making a statement. They're really not asking for information. They're actually making a statement. And so the first question is, where did this man get these things? The interesting thing about that question is they don't ask Jesus this is a condescending thing. You know, here's Jesus. They don't say, Jesus, where'd you, where'd you learn that? They say, where did this man get these things? You know, that's, that's, not, that's a rude way of putting it, right? They're, they're talking down. They don't even want to address him. And so you can see they have no respect for this man, Jesus, in the way they even ask the questions. Because um, Jesus' teaching was different. Uh, every every uh, uh, synagogue had someone reading the scripture, teaching the law. They do this every Saturday, every Saturday. And here's someone that does it, and they're astonished, which means there's something different about this man's teaching. It was fresh. It was original. Uh, it it uh, was in depth. It had, they'd never seen before. And, of course, they see things that he does you know, in a miraculous way that, that uh, are remarkable as well. Uh, but where did this man get these things? And so they, they, they can understand how this man, Jesus, could have this level of, of understanding or this level of wisdom to be, to be doing what he's doing. Uh, where is the wisdom given to him? Jesus has no academic credentials. Uh, he has no diploma. He hasn't been to some famous religious school. Uh, he's just an ordinary guy from a, a no-place town. And so how in the world could this man get this wisdom? Now, if you look in uh, uh, Acts 22, just as a, a point of comparison, here's Paul addressing the crowd. Here's what Paul says. Uh, Acts 22, starting in verse 3. I'm a Jew born in Tarsus in Cilicia, but brought up in this city, educated at the feet of Gamaliel, according to the strict manner of the law of our fathers, Here's my credentials. I started under Gamaliel. Acts chapter 5 tells that Gamaliel 
was a teacher of the law held in honor by all the people. So you want to have academic credentials? Study in the feet of Gamaliel in his, in his school. That means something. And so Jesus didn't have that. He couldn't point to any, any credentials to say, this is where I got this. I'm an educated person. Couldn't do that. And the people knew that. And so they say, how did he get his wisdom? He hasn't been to school. He hasn't learned this. How, how can he be doing this? So again, no respect. How are such mighty works done by his hands? Whose hands? The hands of a carpenter. The hands of a rabbi? No. The hands of some educated great person? No. The hands of a noble person? No. The hands of a famous person? No. This guy's a carpenter. Now, they're not downgrading the fact that he's a carpenter because, in fact, the Jews uh, valued trade, craftsmanship. Uh, in fact, the, the, they had a saying that uh, if you don't teach your son a trade, you're teaching him to steal because the Jews valued work. And so being a carpenter was not anything to look down on. The point is, that's just an average guy. He's not a great teacher. He's a carpenter. He's a laborer. He works with his hands. Those are calloused hands. Those aren't the hands of a learned person. So I want to dig a little deeper into uh, what does it mean to be a carpenter? You know, we all, everybody knows, we're talking talk to little kids, that Jesus was a carpenter. You know, the word carpenter is found two times in the New Testament. One here in Mark, and one in Matthew's account of this same thing. There he says the carpenter's son. This is not the carpenter's son. That's the only two places we find the word carpenter in the New Testament. That's found several places in the Old Testament. Uh, for instance, talking about building the temple, they talk about some of the craftsmen. Uh, the word carpenter really means a crafter of wood. And so uh, that can mean a, a wide variety of things. When I was a child, when I learned that Jesus was a carpenter and his, his, his dad, Joseph, was a carpenter, I thought about Pinocchio, kindly old Geppetto, right? I see Joseph. He's, he's in his carpenter shop downtown Nazareth. Uh, there's a sign over the door, Joseph and Sons Carpenter, you're woodworking. You go inside, and Joseph has on a leather carpenter's apron. There are wood shavings on the floor. He's working on building a chair. Little boy Jesus on the floor. He's playing with some wood scraps, or Joseph's teaching him how to use some wood tools. And that's not what this means, I don't think. I don't think that's what Joseph was. The carpenter guild was sort of like the unions. And the big towns drew the town of carpenters. Now, some carpenters were carvers or made fine furniture, really were, were, were high-talented craftsmen. Uh, but others just did routine-type stuff. Now, in Palestine, the trees were not abundant. Remember when they built the temple? Did, did they go out in the yard and, and cut down trees for the temple? They got to go to Lebanon for the cedars, bring in cedars from Lebanon. They didn't have big trees, so the trees in Palestine were not typically used to frame houses and do things. Uh, typically used stone, and the, the wood might have been used for like roof rafters or to build doors, window frames, whatever. And so the, the use of wood in that area was limited. And so um, Justin Martyr, who was a, like a second century apologist, he says Jesus made plows and such. And so Joseph and Jesus and his brothers were probably rough carpenters. They may have been doing some construction work, or making farm implements, maybe making some rudimentary furniture, but they weren't fine woodworkers, furniture makers, like I, my, my, my thought was. Uh, point being was, Joseph and his sons were just ordinary people. Nothing special at all. And so the people don't understand, how can this just ordinary guy, a carpenter, he makes farm implements, or he, makes, uh, he builds uh, doors or whatever, how can he be teaching these things? And how can he do these miraculous things? It, they were astonished, struck by lightning, right? Could not figure this out. And so these, these things defy explanation. So things that we can't explain, we typically deny, right? This can't be true. I, I can't understand this. Now, I'm trained as an engineer, right? And I'm trained to understand things, to understand physical things, how things work. And that's how engineers work. You figure out how things work if it's broken. You figure out how it's supposed to work, and you fix what's not working. So I'm all about understanding things. But there's some things that just defy explanation. I just, you, don't, you just can't explain things. But the typical thing to do is if you can't explain it, deny it. It can't be true. You know, do we really land on the moon? 
can't explain that, so you, you say it, it didn't happen. Um, actually, the first guy on the moon was from my alma mater, so I think it was true. Anyway, uh, nothing significant about uh, this man, a common ordinary guy, and so they can't see how his hands could be doing this. Uh, they mentioned his family. Uh, his family is known to everybody. We, we've known Mary since she was a little girl. Uh, we, we know his brothers are here with us. They call him by name. His sisters, they don't name them, but he has sisters. These are just routine people. They just, just live down the street. We've known Jesus since he was a little kid. He can't be doing this. It just uh, defies explanation. We know even Jesus' uh, family, his brothers, uh, do not believe in him uh, for the longest time, and maybe some of them never do. Uh, but they take offense. So Jesus makes a comment here. And the way this is translated, Mark, is a bit double negative. It's just kind of hard to follow, maybe. A prophet is not without honor except in his hometown and among his relatives and his own household. Now, in Luke, it's translated a bit differently. It says, truly, I say to you, no prophet is acceptable in his hometown. That, to me, makes more, it's more direct. Uh, but it's the same meaning. Uh, that a prophet can go any place except his hometown because familiarity does what? Breeds contempt, right? Uh, this can't be someone that we know so well. It, this can't be true. This can't be happening. And so they can't accept him as uh, being a great teacher uh, or certainly a being deity. It cannot be true of this common, ordinary guy. So the people's lack of faith here um, prevent Jesus from doing anything more uh, in this town, in his hometown. Uh, it says, except he healed a few sick people, uh, perhaps they are ones who believed. Um, but I think the reason here is Jesus has a pure faith, and he can't understand why people don't share that faith. And we see several times in the stories in, in the, the Gospels where Jesus encounters a lack of faith, and he's just stunned. He can't understand this. How can you not see this? And the faith he has doesn't allow him to see lack of faith. It just is beyond him. How can you see what I'm doing and teaching and not believe it? How is this possible? He's just flabbergasted at their lack of faith. And so he leaves Nazareth and goes uh, to other towns and villages where uh, they do accept uh, his teaching. Let's go on and, and read um, 7 through 13. <clears throat> this is where Jesus sends out his apostles, the 12 apostles. Remember we talked about uh, in Mark 3 where he calls his disciples together, and now that number he chooses 12 to be apostles. The apostles are messengers. These are guys who are going to spend time with Jesus. He's going to train them. Uh, he knows that his time is short, and so if he doesn't get these guys ready, when he leaves, it'll be, it'll be over with. And so these guys have to be ready to carry on and establish the church and, uh, and get things going after, he, after his death. Let's read, uh, starting in 7. And he called the 12, that is the 12 apostles, and began to send them out two by two and gave them authority over the unclean spirits. He charged them to take nothing for their journey except a staff, no bread, no bag, no money in their belts, but to wear sandals and not put on two tunics. And he said to them, whenever you enter a house, stay there until you depart from there. And if any place will not receive you and they will not listen to you, when you leave, shake off the dust that is on your feet as a testimony against them. So they went out and proclaimed that people should repent. And they, and, and they cast out many demons and anointed with oil many who were sick and healed them. <clears throat> First of all, again, what was John the Baptist's message? Repent. What was Jesus' message? Repent. What was the apostles' message? Repent. See the continuity of what's going on here. He says about two by two. So I think this uh, shows the wisdom of Jesus. Uh, you know, if you go out by yourself, uh, it's a bad idea uh, for many reasons. And Jesus understood that they needed to be in, in groups of two. Uh, because of um, uh, the reinforcement you have, if one person is, is talking and he, he's not getting any place, the second person fills in, so they kind of are complimentary to each other. 
Uh, for safety's sake, traveling in pairs is better. Uh, for the sake of, of, um, of a witness for what's going on, it's better to have two. In, in, our, in our children's classes, we, our policy is to have two people there. So it's just good policy. So Jesus uh, understands um, in a leadership uh, style how to send these guys out in a, in a way that's going to work, in a way for their safety, in a way that's going to be effective. When I read this letter, who went with Judas? You can imagine, gee, okay, guys, we're going to see you out two by two. James and John, they, we're, we're going. Peter and Simon, Peter and uh, Andrew, we're good. We're brothers. We're going. Who wants to go with Judas? Maybe Judas wasn't this way to start with. Remember, John later calls him. Judas was a thief. I hid his money in the, in the purse. Uh, but maybe not at this early date. But anyway, you wonder, who went with Judas? But he sends him out two by two. And the other thing he does here, which is interesting, if I was sending you out on a, on a mission, you're going to be out for, for several days, whatever, I'd get you prepared. Uh, you, you can only take two suitcases. But make sure you pack, you know, some, some uh, extra, get a sweater in case it gets cold. Take an extra pair of shoes in case you, you know, step in a mud puddle or whatever. I'd make sure you had everything you needed. Make sure you play, take plenty, plenty of money. May not be a bank where you're going. You know, need some extra cash to get by. Jesus says, "Don't take anything. Don't take a bag. To put your money in. Don't take money. Don't take any bread. People would travel with with bread to, to eat on their journey. Don't take that. Don't put shoes on. Put on sandals. The the basic, most basic shoes. Don't take an extra coat. Um, why do you do that? You guys go out. You're going to trust in God. God's going to take care of you." You know, if you pack up your suitcases, get all the stuff you need, and take a bunch of money, who are you trusting in? The fact that you know how to pack your bag, right? You didn't forget anything. Mm, not doing that. Don't take anything. Well, how are we supposed to survive? When you go to somebody's house, they're going to take care of you. You stay there. As long as you're in that town, you stay there. They're going to feed you. They're going to take care of you. And so don't worry about it. God is, maybe God is, is uh, preparing people in those towns to be receptive, to be hospitable. Uh, and somehow you're going to be taken care of. So don't uh, rely on your own, your own self. You know, that's not the way we're going to do this. And so uh, Jesus is preparing them to understand that it's not about them. It's about God. God is going to take care of you, not just on this trip, but for the duration of your ministry. And so you need to learn right now that you need to rely on God, trust in God. Uh, and so that was very insightful on Jesus' part to... Uh, prepare them in this way uh, to support each other, yes, but to trust in God for their physical necessities, the things they're going to need uh, on their, their journey while they're out uh, doing these things. And it gives them uh, power, uh, healing power. Uh, and so as they're going out uh, teaching people to repent, you can imagine someone says, well, who are you guys? Who are you to tell me to repent? Uh, we've heard about John the Baptist. He's a, he's a great preacher. But who are you guys? Well, these guys are guys who can do things that prove that they're from God. They're going to do miraculous things to validate the fact that what they're saying is from God. And so they needed that uh, miraculous ability to validate uh, the, the spoken word in the things they're doing. Okay, the next section is interesting. This is a historical flashback, we might say, because uh, at this point, uh, John the Baptist is already dead. But Mark is going to step back and tell us how it happened uh, because John the Baptist's name comes up. And so he's going to explain why that comes up and what's going on here. Uh, the first couple of verses here, uh, starting at verse 14, King Herod heard of it, for Jesus' name had become known. Some said John the Baptist has been raised from the dead. That is why these miraculous powers are at work in him. But others said he's Elijah, others said he's a prophet, like one of the prophets. But when Herod heard of it, he said, John, who might be headed, has been raised. When you read about Herod, it's confusing because the translators use the word Herod for several different people. You know, if you go back to the first of the Gospels, there's a Herod who is afraid that Jesus is going to take over the king, he, kingdom. He's... I'm looking for Jesus, has boy, babies killed. That's Herod the Great. 
Herod the Great. This Herod is one of Herod the Great's sons. Uh, this is Herod Antipas. After Herod the Great um, uh, died, his kingdom was kingdom. They're under Roman control. They're not really kings. Uh, but his kingdom was divided into four parts, tetrarchs. And so other places we see, uh, like in Luke, that uh, Herod is uh, Herod the tetrarch. So he was the tetrarch over a fourth part of being Galilee, Samaria, and uh, Perea. He was uh, one of the sons, I think the seventh son of Herod the Great. Uh, an interesting thing I, I didn't know before. Again, you find out, when you start digging into things, you find out really some interesting things. Herod apparently was not Jewish. Do you know that? Uh, Josephus says that the Herods were Edomites, which are descendants from Esau, not Jacob. Jacob, whose name was changed to Israel, that's the Jewish line from Abraham. Esau, they're cousins, but they're not Jewish. And so I find it interesting that uh, the, the Jewish king is not Jewish. He's a cousin. And he's not really king because uh, the emperor of Rome is king. They're really just administrators. Um, but interesting. Uh, now, he's married to the daughter of King Aretas of Arabia, uh, probably for political reasons. But he divorces her, and he marries the wife of his brother Philip, who is also has been, his power has been taken away. He's a nobody. And that's probably why Herodias, his wife, left him because he has no power. So she's looking for someone who has some power. So she agrees to marry uh, Antipas. And so uh, Herodias uh, marries um, Herod Antipas. Uh, because of this, King Aretas in, uh, I think it was 39 AD, uh, attacks Herod and defeats his army and takes control and deposes him. And so Herod and Herodias wind up dying in exile. And uh, I think it's Josephus says that that was God's punishment for him doing what he did to John the Baptist. If you kill John, you get deposed. And he used King Aretas uh, to accomplish that. Uh, Herodias was also a daughter. So he's marrying, he's marrying into it. They're marrying uh, relatives. The whole 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 story is, is sort of sorted. It gets even worse here in a little bit. Uh, so John the Baptist uh, uh, sees what Herod has done, marrying his uh, brother's wife, divorcing his first wife and all this. And John uh, gets in Herod's face and says, this is wrong. You, you got to quit that. This is, this is sin. And so uh, Herod doesn't like this, but the people like John, so Herod doesn't know anything about it. But Herodias is just fit to be tied. And so she's very upset wanting to find out a way to get rid of John the Baptist. So not only is adultery one of the Ten Commandments, one of the big ones, the Seventh Commandment, but also if you look at Leviticus, uh, you're forbidden to have relations with your brother's wife. As well as several, several uh, near relatives were mentioned, but your brother's wife is specifically mentioned. So Herod is guilty of two sins, and John the Baptist isn't going to let this go. I you think John the Baptist could have said, Hey, this guy's king. You need to give him a pass here, right? Or who am I to get involved in this? This is going to stir up trouble. I get thrown in jail for this. Yeah, I'm going to leave this alone. John the Baptist couldn't let it go. He could not let it go. And he keeps telling uh, Herod, uh, this is a sin. And you're the king. What are you doing here? You're supposed to be an example to us, and you can't do this. And so a good point here, a whole other lesson would be that uh, even though Herod is not Jewish, John the Baptist calls him on Jewish law. Point being, God's moral law doesn't just apply to those who believe in God. It doesn't just apply to Christians. You can't say, I don't believe in God, I'm atheist, so therefore adultery doesn't apply to me. You can't say that because that's a moral law that applies to everybody. You can't say, well, I'm... Uh, I'm Hindu or whatever, so your Christian law doesn't apply to me. 
wrong. God's moral laws applies to everybody, whether you accept it or not. So that's a good point here in this story. King Herod was, a, was the subject of those laws, whether he wanted to be or not. Okay, so um, for sake of time, I think we're not going to read this whole thing. You're probably familiar with this uh, story. Uh, along comes uh, a birthday party, and um, let's step back a minute. Let's talk about John the Baptist a bit more. It's also called John the Baptizer. It's probably a better, better term. We call him John the Baptist. But uh, Jesus and John related. You remember in Luke uh, chapter 1, uh, Mary is told your relative, Elizabeth, is going to have a child in her old age. And so Mary and Elizabeth are somehow related. Don't know how. Elizabeth is much, much older than, than Mary. So they're probably not first cousins. They may be distant cousins, or maybe Elizabeth is a cousin of one of her parents or something. They're not, they're not really close relatives. And so we don't find them, we don't find John and Jesus anyplace interacting. We're not told anything about them. Matter of, matter of fact, when Jesus comes to John, John doesn't seem to say, hey, Jesus, cousin, how you doing? They don't seem to be that close. I, don't, I think they're distant cousins somehow, but they are related. Uh, and we talked about John's mission a while ago to, to prepare the way for Jesus. And one interesting thing John says, uh, I think it's in John 3, 30, the, the Gospel of John uh, 3, 30. John is talking about his mission. He talks about this one who's coming after me. I'm not worthy to even untie his sandals. He's much greater than me. I must decrease and he must increase. I think that was, that was prophetic, but John understood his mission. John's mission is going to have an end. And that was when Jesus was to, to take over. Problem being, John still had disciples when Jesus was starting his, his ministry, his disciples. And as long as John was alive, those disciples were going to stay with John. We see John's disciples coming to Jesus, ask him, well, why don't they just come to Jesus and stay? Because they're disciples of John the Baptist. And so John the Baptist has to go away in order for Jesus to get those disciples. So there's always going to be a faction there as long as John's alive. So I suspect that this whole thing of John's demise is part of God's plan, that John couldn't continue as long as, as Jesus uh, continued because that was going to cause a conflict. John's disciples weren't going to come over to Jesus uh, while John was there. Um, so anyway, uh, there's a birthday party in... So, or Herodias' daughter, who Josephus says her name was Salome. Uh, this gets even more, more sordid because uh, Salome was the daughter of Philip, Herod's brother, and Herodias. So Salome is Herod's niece and his stepdaughter, and probably a young girl, early teens, we would guess. Of course, she's, she's unmarried at this time, apparently. And so she comes in and dances before the, the crowd, the king, and pleases the king which means it was probably a lascivious sort of dance of his niece and stepdaughter. And so Herod says, oh, Simone, that would be wonderful. I'll give you anything you want, up to half of my kingdom. She, don't, she doesn't have a clue. What? What does that mean? So she's an innocent young girl. So she goes to her mother. Her mother is a terrible person, right? Because she tells her daughter, Go ask for Herod, Herod to kill John the Baptist and bring his head on a platter. Can you imagine telling your teenage daughter that? This is terrible. She's a terrible person. That's what she does. And so Salome didn't know she goes and tells Herod. Herod doesn't like that because he, he sort of liked John. He knew the people liked John. But he wasn't, he wasn't going to back, back down on his promise, so he does that. Sends to prison, has John beheaded, and brings the head of John the Baptist on a platter into this birthday party. Terrible. I was saying, I've, I've read this story, heard this story so many times that I don't react to it. And I wish I could remember the first time I heard this story. I'd be shocked. Wouldn't you be shocked if this is the first time you heard this story? That the king has his niece and stepdaughter come and do a lascivious dance, and, and his wife has this teenage girl come and ask him to kill a person and bring him the head on a, pl on a platter. This is this horrible story. Horrible, horrible. Uh, I said we've become callous to that sort of thing, I guess. Uh, but that's what happened to John the Baptist. So 
what Mark is doing here, because Herod is a bit superstitious and he is guilty of what he did to John the Baptist, he thinks that Jesus is a reincarnation. And so Mark wants to tell us why Herod would think that. Uh, because Herod did something very heinous in, in killing John the Baptist. Okay, so that is that story, sort of a, an aside in the, in the story. So uh, let's look quickly at Jesus uh, feeding the 5,000. Uh, got about five minutes left. Uh, let's start in verse uh, 30. I'll read through this uh, rather quickly. The apostles returned to Jesus and told him all that they had done and taught. And he said to them, come away by yourselves to a desolate place and rest a while. For many were coming and going, and they had no leisure even to eat. And they went away in the boat to a desolate place from, by themselves. Now many saw them going and recognizing them, and they ran there on foot from all the towns and got there ahead of them. When he went ashore, he saw a great crowd, and he had compassion on them, because they were like sheep without a shepherd. And he began to teach them many things, and when it grew late, his disciples came and said, this is a desolate place, and the hour is now late. Send them away to go into the surrounding countryside and villages and buy themselves something to eat. But he answered them, you give them something to eat. And they said to him, shall we go and buy 200 denarii worth of bread and give it to them to eat? And he said to them, how many loaves do you have? Go and see. And when they had found out, they said, five and two fish. And he commanded them, all to sit down in groups on the grass, green grass. So he sat down in groups by hundreds and by fifties, and taking the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven and said a blessing and broke the loaves and gave them to the disciples to set before the people. And he divided the two fish among them all, and they all ate and were satisfied, and they took up 12 baskets full of broken pieces and of the fish. And those who ate the loaves were 5,000 men. Of course, 5,000 men, could the total number of people could be two or three times that amount. Don't know how many people were there, but a lot of people. So this shows a couple of things about this man. Jesus, one is compassion we've seen before. Uh, Jesus could not pass up someone in need. It didn't matter what the need was. It's sickness or uh, infirmity, whatever, or in this case, hunger. He couldn't see this big crowd. Now, if this auditorium were filled, it would hold 500 people. Imagine 5,000 people. Ten times the size of this auditorium. How much food would it take to feed 5,000 people? Even a little bit of food. That's an incredible amount of food. And so what do they have? Handful, just a handful of bread and fish. But Jesus used that to multiply and feed 5,000 men plus whatever women and children were there. Tremendous amount of food. So this was a, a huge, big, big miracle that, that Jesus did here. Uh, and we see his organization as well. Can you imagine 5,000 people? How are we going to feed 5,000 people? Start a line. 5,000 people can't do that. Sit down. Let's get organized here. Set them in groups of hundreds and fifties, right, in rows, so you can have passing. Let's get organized here. So Jesus understands organization and how to, how to get things done and orderly so it's not a, a panic or a crowd. And so uh, I appreciate that about him. All right, last uh, story here that we're going to look at is uh, starting in verse uh, 45. Immediately he made his apostles get into the boat and go before him to the other side, to Bethsaida, where he dismissed the crowd, while he dismissed the crowd. And after he had taken leave of them, he went up on the mountain to pray. And when evening came, the boat was out on the sea, and he was alone on the land. And he saw that they were making headway painfully, for the wind was against them. And about the fourth watch of the night, he came to them, walking on the sea. He meant to pass by them, but when they saw him walking on the sea, they thought it was a ghost and cried out. For they all saw him and were terrified. But immediately he spoke to them and said, Take heart, it is I, do not be afraid. And he got into the boat with them, and the wind ceased, and they were utterly astonished. They did not understand about the loaves, but their hearts were hardened. So here we see a couple of things about Jesus. One is he understood you can't go 90 miles an hour 24-7. You've got to take a break. And so he tells his disciples, get in the boat, let's get away from all these people. You've got to have a break. You guys go. I'll be there, to, I'll be there in a little bit. So he goes up by himself to pray. So spend some time alone 
in prayer, in uh, meditation, refreshing. So we understood the need for rest and recuperating. About the fourth watch, would have, which would be in the middle of the night, uh, 3 to 6 a.m. would have been the fourth watch. They're out dark on the sea. They're not doing well in their little boat. Wind is blowing. Uh, remember before, they had the same situation. Jesus is asleep in the boat. Wind's crashing, waves crashing. They wake him up. We're about to die here. Jesus said, what? Speaks to the wind. Calm. Uh, chapter 4. Who is this man? And even the wind and the waves obey his voice. So here they are out in this boat. Same situation, winds, terrible storm, whatever, and they're, they're afraid. Now, what's Jesus do, and why does he do it? He walks out on the sea. Why did he mean to pass by? Now, you read this and think, is Jesus a jokester? I'm going to sneak by him, get up in front and scare him. I don't think so. His point was he was going to pass by, and they're going to see him and say, oh, there's Jesus. We're going to be all right. He's going to calm the wind. We're saved because there's Jesus. Not their reaction, right? They're afraid. It's a ghost. What is that? Jesus is, again, just astonished. Come on, guys. You just saw me feed 5,000 people with a handful of food. Who does that? The Son of God does that. Who walks on the water out in the middle of the sea? The Son of God does that. Who calmed the storm? The Son of God does that. They didn't understand. Didn't understand the lows. Didn't understand him walking on the water. They were astonished. Couldn't, couldn't understand that. And so Jesus here um, says their hearts were hardened. Again, things you can't explain, you don't accept. And these men had been with Jesus long enough and seen Jesus do enough things, they should have had this figured out by now. But their hearts were hard and they just could not see it. And so Jesus here, I think, is uh, um, not pleased probably with what he sees. He thinks they should be further along by now, uh, but they're not. And... Uh, I can say his pure faith, he doesn't understand how people can't have faith. On what they've seen, you should have faith by now, and they just didn't. And he's just uh, amazed that uh, they don't have the faith that he's expecting here. Okay, our time is uh, past, so we have for this evening. So come back next week uh, for Chapter 7 and go home and watch some of the free Hardman lectureships. All right? If you watch the one from Dan Winkler, when you see me Sunday, you're going to thank me for telling you to see that, all right? And if you don't like it, I'll return your money, which you don't have anything in anyway. So it's risk-free, but those are really, really good. Thank you for your attention tonight. We are dismissed. Who missed, guys?